Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to church today, and we're so glad to have you um, in the house of the Lord this morning. Um, a few quick announcements before we begin this morning um, into our service. Our Bible reading as a church, as we're reading this week, um, is Psalm 26 through Psalm 30. Um, and our memory verse that we're working on is Psalm 27, uh, verse 4. That's in your bulletin this week. Um, I invite you to come back and be a part of our uh, Sunday evening service tonight. Um, as we have been studying uh, where we got the Bible, 
um, and how we base our life off of Scripture, but Old Testament, New Testament to today, what happened through all those thousands of years, um, that we can have assurance that the Word of God, um, that, that we guide our life on. And so I invite you to come back with us. We got through kind of the, the writing of the New Testament. We're kind of going to jump into the 1600s a little bit tonight to understand getting ready from the, the English Bibles that we have today. Um, this Wednesday is a ladies' Bible study here at the church um, starting at 11.30 a.m. So ladies are invited uh, to be here this Wednesday at 11.30 a.m. And then our fellowship this week, uh, chair volleyball at Lagunda Elementary at 6 p.m. So all is invited um, we have a great time for chair volleyball um, at, again, 6 p.m. at Lagunda Elementary. Um, and then next week, the Fights will be here with us. They are uh, missionaries getting ready to start a church um, in North Dakota. So he'll be preaching for us next week um, and uh, be much in prayer for that service. Um, and then just real quick here in a few weeks on a Saturday, we do have an advisory board meeting for those of you um, on the advisory board. And so as we enter into our worship this morning, our worship text today is found in John chapter 4, verse 24, that said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And our, our message today is going to be focused on truth, and so what a beautiful verse to start our worship today, uh, that we worship God as spirit and worship him in truth. So let's go to him in prayer as we begin our worship. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Thank you for bringing us through another week and bringing us back together into your house today. Thank you for those um, that are here in person and those joining online this morning. And Lord, we just ask that your spirit will be present in this service. Lord, that your spirit will lead. And Lord, that it will, it, it will comfort us in times of need, Lord. Um, but that, Lord, that it will uh, draw our hearts to your word today. Lord, we love you. And Lord, we just ask that everything we say and do today is not of us today. Um, but is to bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, at this time, we'll begin our worship through song um, as we turn the service over to Brother Dan and Sister Leslie. Um, and as they come, just real quick, I forgot um, our slogan uh, for the year. Every year we come up with a slogan for the year. So this year is 2023. Uh, we extended that contest till next week because um, I think there's only four or five entries back there in the box. So um, if you'd like to come up with a nice jingle rhyme for 2023, um, be sure to fill one of those out and put it in the box by next week. Mine's going to win. Don't you feel that way about yours? Yeah. Five and a quarter, 525. A little as much. <clears throat> In the harvest field now ripen, there's a work for all to do. Hark the voice of God is calling to the harvest calling you. Little is much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown, and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Does the place you're called to labor seem so small and little known? It is great if God is in it, and he'll not forget his own. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. When the conflict here is ended and our race on earth is run, he will say, if we are faithful, welcome home, my child, well done. Little is much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown, and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. 529. 
verses 1, 3, and 5. I wandered in the shades of night till Jesus came to me. And with the sunlight of his love bid all my darkness flee. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin, I have had the sunlight of his love within. While walking in the light of God, I sweet communion find. I press with holy vigor on and leave the world behind. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin. I have had the sunlight of his love within. Soon I shall see him as he is the light that came to me. Behold the brightness of his face throughout eternity. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin. I have had the sunlight of his love within. 534, first and last verse. Walking in sunlight all of my journey Over the mountains, through the deep vale Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee Promise divine that never can fail Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight Flooding my soul with glory divine Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praises, Jesus is mine. In the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, pressing my way to mansions above, singing His praises, gladly I'm walking, walking in sunlight, sunlight of love. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. And just before we go to the Lord in prayer, our, uh, our missionaries of the week is Jonathan and Amy um, in Bulgaria. We want to remember them in prayer. Um, and also our sister church of the week is the Troy Rural Baptist, uh, pastor by Dwight Stump. Uh, we want to remember that church in our prayers as well. Um, before we go to the Lord in prayer, does anyone have a prayer request uh, they'd like to mention this morning? Someone else. Yvonne. Someone else today. Um, 
some of you know um, Sue Keener, Paul Keener, um, over in Columbus is his wife. Um, she's had a couple of surgeries this week uh, with some bleeding on the brain. Um, so she's up in the hospital in Columbus. Um, so remember her and that family again. Um, so that's uh, Sue Keener, um, Paul Keener, so their son Tim Keener was a missionary for years. So remember that. Um, all those with unspoken requests this morning give a sign of lifted hand. And um, uh, Dan Fraley, can I ask you to take us to the Lord in prayer today? Um, at this time, we have a very uh, special time for uh, baby dedication. So, Christine, you can bring your boy up here. And this is baby Kai. Baby Kai, and this is Christina. This is uh, Keith Lincoln's daughter. Um, some of you may know her. And Keith Lincoln passed away a little over a year ago, a member here at the church. And I'm so glad to have her and the baby this morning. And uh, she reached out and asked if we could dedicate the baby today. Um, and a beautiful thing. And, um, you know, baby dedication is something that we're instructed by Scripture. We see that, that Christ as a child was taken by Mother Mary um, uh, to the temple, according to the law of Moses at the time. Uh, we see even Solomon um, uh, being taken um, to the temple. And so let's um, enter into this as, as a time of dedication of, of the child. It says, like Mary and Hannah of old had brought your child to the house of God to present him to the Lord. You've heard the words of the master. Suffer the little children and forbid them not to come unto me. For as such is the kingdom of heaven. The young life which you hold in your arms is both a mystery and a wonder. God has placed in your hearts in a compelling sense of dignity of life and the obligation of parenthood. The scriptures give us an example of how godly parents dedicate their children to the Lord and service. Hannah brought her child Samuel and dedicated him to God to the service of his house. Mary, the mother of Jesus, brought the child according to the law of Moses up to Jerusalem and presented him to the Lord. We are confident, therefore, that the Lord's divine approval as this child is brought this day to be dedicated to him and his service. It is our duty as Christ, a Christian congregation to receive this child into the care of the church and to minister to him at every possible way. Scripture says, Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven... There are angels do not behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Even so, if it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy child, and shalt walk with them when thou sittest in the house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it. God has a purpose for your child's life. To find that purpose and to live it out fully will mean blessing. And to refuse or ignore it will mean failure. It is a privilege and duty to guide your child in such a way to make the will of God the greatest ambition of his life. In this task, you are called to dedicate yourself to the end and dedicate to your child of God. Um, at this time, I'm going to ask Christina... Um, uh, to just say I do after these words. Uh, do you dedicate yourself as a parent to raise your child in a nurturing um, home for the Lord? And do you promise to instruct him in the Bible and in the practice of prayer to guide him in the development of Christ-like character? Do you promise to try to do your best of your ability to shape the home and the life of your child by your words and examples? 
so that he will come to receive and confess Christ when old enough to understand and come into the fellowship. Okay, so at this time, we're going to go ahead and say a blessing and prayer um, of dedication uh, for Kai. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you today uh, for our, our sweet little baby boy, Kai. We thank you for Christina and her heart for you. And Lord, uh, we thank you for this time that we have. Lord, uh, all life is a blessing from you. And Lord, this life in particular is a blessing. And Lord, we just pray a special prayer over his life. And Lord, as he grows, Lord, that, that, that as scripture says, that you have plans for all of us. And you have a plan for this little one, even years down the road. And Lord, we just ask that you be with Christina and her family and other children, Lord, that you will wrap your loving arms around them, that they will feel the love and the hope that only comes from you, Lord. And as this child grows, may he know and come to the knowledge of the saving grace of you, that when you draw him to you, to, to you in that day, that he will give his life to you in salvation. Lord, we love you today. We give you all these praise and glory and thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Yeah, and we'll just give a little gift here, just uh, the sign. We got a little certificate um, uh, of this day. We've got a little Bible, and there's a little stuffed animal in here for him. Thank so, you. Thank you. <laughs> all right, if at this time, if uh, the Fraley's will come. Um, and they will be singing for us today. Blessed Savior wrote my name when I was born again. He wrote it when he saved my soul. He wrote that I had made a right my every sinful wrong. He wrote my name on heaven's roll. He wrote my name way up in glory. He saved my soul from sin and shame. From sin and shame, I never shall, oh, I never shall, forget, the shall day forget the day the blessed Savior wrote my, name. wrote my name. I'll be no stranger when I reach my home in glory land. My name is in the book of life. The blessed Savior wrote it when he saved my soul from sin. He saved my soul from sin and strife. He wrote my name, my name way, up, way up, in glory. up in glory land. He saved my soul, Jesus saved my soul from sin and shame. From sin and shame. I never shall, oh, I never shall forget, the day, shall forget the day the blessed Savior wrote my name. If I should live a hundred years upon this earth below, I never could forget the day, forget the day that Jesus wrote my name within the blessed book of life and took my many sins away. My sins away, he wrote my name, my name way up, way up, up in glory. Up in glory. Jesus saved my soul from sin and shame. From sin and shame. I never shall, no, I never shall forget, the day, shall forget the day the blessed Savior wrote my name. He wrote my name.
line with our baby dedication. The song's for you and the baby, okay? And all of you, without prayer, that's, that's our biggest defense. We need each other's prayers. <clears throat> Somebody's praying, I can't feel it. Somebody's praying for me. Mighty hands are guiding me to protect me from what I can't see. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Somebody's praying for me. We need it. <clears throat> Angels are watching. I can feel it. Angels are watching over me many miles ahead till i get home still i'm safely kept before your throne lord i believe lord i believe angels are watching over me well i've walked through the barren wilderness where my pillow was a stone and I've been through the darkest caverns where no light has ever shone went on cause there was someone who was down on their knees <clears throat> Lord I thank you for those people praying all this time for me somebody's praying i can feel it <clears throat> somebody's praying for me mighty hands are guiding me to protect me from what i can't see lord i believe lord i believe somebody's praying for me somebody's praying for me being treasured up <clears throat> it may not happen when I think it should but God will divvy those prayer requests and those answers out in his time when it's the best for me so that's what we need for each other what's best for each other today truth is based on feelings culture, and personal encounters. Truth seems to change more and more rapidly, evolving into something totally unrecognizable. Our truth is whatever we want it to be. But does that make sense? Do we really have the authority to manipulate foundational truths to satisfy our own desires? What about an ultimate truth that transcends time and generations? Jesus spoke truth to anyone who would listen in a way they would understand. He shared simple, relatable stories to explain a vast heavenly plan. To the lost, to the hurting, to the confused. If you are seeking the truth, it's real and it can be yours. I tell you the truth. Bibles with you this morning. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. 
um, Ephesians chapter 6, and um, this morning I'm going to start a kind of multi-week um, series looking at the armor of God. Um, I know we've got a, a guest minister next week that will be preaching and some singers in a couple weeks, so uh, this will, uh, Lord willing, um, as long as he continues to lay this on my heart over uh, the next few weeks, we're going to cover the different aspects of the armor of God individually each week. Um, and today we're going to look at the the shield or the um, the girding your waistband or the belt of truth. And so we're going to start here looking at the armor of God as as Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter six. And so this is kind of a, a familiar passage I've preached on the armor of God before, never in a multi-week series. But in the essence of talking about the fact that a lot of times that that we think some of our battles in life is against each other. And that Paul addresses that, that our hardships and our battles in life is, is really the root of it is a spiritual battle. Um, there has always been, from the foundations of the earth since the fall of man in the garden, there has been a spiritual battle on this earth. And it has continued through time over the ages. Even today, there continues to be a spiritual battle. And so Paul lays out 2,000 years ago in the best way that he could in an analogy of how that we can prepare ourselves for these spiritual battles that we face day to day. And so he uses this in the essence of an armor, or armor of God being prepared um, of the, the enemy's shots or the devil. So let's begin reading here, um, Ephesians chapter 6, uh, starting here in verse 10. Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wails of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of the age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in that evil day and having done all to stand. And here's our key verse this morning in verse 14. It says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on your breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, which, uh, which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, with being watchful to the end with all uh, preservance and supplication for all the saints. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you today. Thank you for this special day that we have to be in your house, Lord. And as we draw from your word, this spiritual battle that Paul writes 2,000 years ago continued to raise on today around the world. And not just in foreign lands, but in our communities, in our homes, in our lives, in the workplace. There continues to be spiritual battles every single day. And Lord, starting today over the next week, several weeks, Lord, will you open up your scriptures and, and guide your spirit to us on how that we can be able to stand within these battles in life. Lord, we love you today. In Jesus' name, amen. So as I said, this morning I, I'm not going to face so, or focus so much on the whole essence of the armor of God, but our focus this morning is the belt of truth. And, but what I will draw your attention to, just kind of as an introduction to this and the, for this week and the weeks to come, is that Paul talks about this spiritual battle. And, and we think that many times he's using an analogy of a sword and a shield and an armor that we have to protect ourselves. And, and, but this is not a conventional battle. And so understand, he's using the analogy, but Paul is giving these simple truths when he's talking about faith or salvation or the Word of God or spirit or righteousness, and here we're going to talk about truth, um, as being ways to be able to help us in a spiritual battle. Conventional weapons only work in a conventional battle. We have to have spiritual weapons when fighting a spiritual battle. And so Paul lays out what these spiritual weapons are, or, or spiritual armor is, um, that we can have in life when we go through these battles. 
And so he says, and he starts all of this in verse 14. He says, stand therefore, and I'm reading New King James, stand there for having girded your waist with truth, or having a belt of truth. And, and I think that's a beautiful thing, that as we go over the next several weeks and break down each of these components, that he begins it all, the whole foundation is based upon truth. And, and what I find ex- just amazing, uh, or sadly, um, in life today, that how much there continues to still be a debate on what is true. What is truth? And, and I've preached on truth. I, I think several years ago, um, Time Magazine um, had, a, had a cover, and I brought it in. I have it home somewhere in my filing cabinet, um, that says, Is Truth Dead? Has Truth Died? And it all came around the time that, that um, there was a lot of, of hype in about false news or um, is news real and everything about that and talking about is truth dead? Is there really truth? In, in the video this morning that I found to introduce to this, I was talk, I was talked about individual truths and how everybody has their own truths and what they believe to be true. But is there an ultimate guiding source of truth in life? And that becomes the basis of it. Today in America and today around the world, there still continues to be an argument of what is true. Now, we can all agree on simple things like 1 plus 1 equals 2. I think we can all agree on a concept as that. Or if you boil water, it will evaporate into mist or some certain things like that. But then what ends up happening is society begins to debate truth on the difference between right and wrong. Society debates truth on morality. Society debates truth on life itself. Last week, our service was dedicated to the sanctity of life, and and we talked about the in-depth of life himself and how God cherishes life so much that he gave his own life so we can have eternal life and that we can live life and have it more abundantly. But there seems to be an argument on what is true about life and what is true about eternity. You know, these questions and this argument, as it seems to be as old as time, and at the root of it, this is a spiritual battle. This is, even though we argue, it seems to be, there seems to be an argument in culture. I'm not saying that we may individual argue these facts, but there seems to be an argument in culture that we seem that, well, it relates to politics, or it relates to this person, or relates to that person. But the heart of it is a spiritual battle. And Paul's saying the spiritual battle in life that we need to stand on truth. And we need to understand what is true. Because in this world, it, just to be honest, it, we all find ourselves seeking and looking for truth. It, it, almost to the point that we long for truth. Okay, if we can all agree. And hopefully we found that truth in Jesus Christ and found that truth in the Word of God. But human nature comes to the point of longing for truth. I mentioned that already in life that there seems to be today this this concept of individual truth. As long as it's true to you, just leave me alone and I leave you alone. And we all have these individual truths and we won't bother each other. And, And that seems to be this this growing culture today, or American culture, and I don't just say American, this is European, this is across the globe becoming these individual truths in, in society and things of this life. And you may say, well, that doesn't harm anybody, but then it begins to affect culture, it begins to affect society, it becomes to affect education, it affects everything if we can't agree on what is true and what we can base upon truth. In reality, sometimes truth is hard. It's hard to follow. In the essence, it's not always easy to follow what is true. We talk about a child, and, and I, um, uh, Rochelle and I, she had to go home today, but we're raising two kids of her own, and sometimes learning what is true. And, and, and those of you that have kids know that kids sometimes can be totally opposite. Um, Gavin, if he gets in trouble... Um, he's one that just kind of depends on what it is, but, but, you know, he's one that doesn't want to be in trouble. He wants to be the best he can be. He, he really doesn't want to be in trouble. Gracie, the other day, he, um, I forget what it was. Gavin said something to Gracie 
um, I forget what word it was, but it was, it, it was just nothing. The word nothing. That's it, the word nothing. Gavin told Gracie that nothing was a cuss word. And so Gracie went up to Rochelle and said, nothing. <laughs> and Rochelle's like, what? Nothing. <laughs> and Rochelle's like, okay. You know, it says, well, Gavin says nothing's a bad word. Well, nothing's not a bad word. Oh, man. And, and Rochelle's like, did you want to say a bad word? I want to say a bad word. You know, it, it, for whatever, uh, bless her heart. Well, she just turned five this week. But in her mind, she was excited to be able to be, cut, be on the edge there doing something that is bad. We, we've talked before, child, we have to teach a child how to do right. We don't have to teach a child necessarily how to do wrong. It's within the nature. If you tell a child not to take a cookie from the cookie jar or whatever that aspect may be, the child wants to give in to temptation and eat all the cookies in the jar. We have to train and teach a child on how to do right and how to do good and, and what is true in life, even though that all of us are different and all of us have different upbringings and experiences in life. It, it's something that we have to long, um, we have to grow in understanding what is true and guide our life according to the truth. And sometimes truth is hard. We want to eat that cookie in the cookie jar. We want to say something that we know that's really not good to say, but we're going to get some really, it's, it's going to get some laughs out of it. And we say this in the simplicity of a child, but as adults, some of that mindset continues to carry through. We do things in life that, that sometimes it's hard to stand upon truth. But when we look at truth, and, and, and I'm going to look back to this belt of truth, I think about Paul, I think about two things. First of all, he used this, number one, as his first point of five points, and I'm going to circle back because he uses this again in Philippians. But here he uses this first of, of, of five or six things of the armor of God, and he starts it all with truth, but he uses the analogy of a belt. What I didn't realize until I was studying this week and going back and looking at this at this time, in this time period, let's use a Roman soldier, or you could use uh, you know, a, a, a soldier of the guard or something, and they have all of their armor on. Everything is geared around the belt. The sword that has the sheath on it is all, it's on the belt. It's on the belt. Um, other things uh, that they have is all based upon the belt. If the belt falls, the other armor and the other items that they have will also fall. And so there's an importance of the foundation or the start with the belt. Without the belt, you can't have other pieces of that armor. Without the belt, you can't have full security. If something happens to that belt, everything else starts falling apart as far as this armor goes. And I think that's so true when we look at truth, on how important truth is. If we don't understand and get our firm foundation in the truth, then everything else, not just relating to this armor of God, but everything else in life can continue to be a struggle because we're still struggling with the foundation of what we need. And when we look at this on how important it is truth. You see, the only source of truth is Jesus Christ. Jesus, in his own words, says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father except for by me. That's the words of Jesus. The video that we watched this morning is how Jesus came and he spoke to those in society um, and did it so simplistic of understanding. Paul's using this analogy so that the people of the time can understand. Preachers, today as I stand before you to try to break this down, so not so it's so above our thinking of a mindset, but so that we can apply it and that we can understand. Because Christ came with love. And Christ says that without, you can't get to God the Father without going through me, is what Jesus Christ said. Now, we studied about God and who God is back in the fall. We looked at God as three persons, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and Jesus being the Son. And God came down and lived a life of, uh, of without sin and died upon the cross and, and was rose from again. And because of that sacrifice, that our sins can be given, be forgiven if we give our life to Him. 
because of that sacrifice that we can have a, a life of hope and that we can find change in our life because our strength does not come from this world. Our strength does not come from one another. Our strength does not come from other things that, that, that the things of the world may be appeal, appealing to the eye, but our strength comes in Jesus Christ. Because he says the only way to God the Father, not just to heaven and eternal life, but the only source of hope that we have is Jesus Christ. If we put our hope in politics or politicians, they're going to let us down. If we put our hope in maybe in security in the bank or people in this world, sadly people, because we are all corrupt by sin, people can let us down. But if we put our hope and security in Jesus Christ, he will never let us down. And that is the truth that is found in Jesus Christ. How important it is on the spiritual battles that we face from day to day that we go through. These battles that we face so many times, we think it's against each other and, and, and what we do against each other. But the whole root of it is the heart of man and the, spirit, the spiritual battle that is raging on in life today. And when we think today, and, and, and I'm not going to get off on this too much, but, but I've talked about this before, talking about Satan as a lion seeking who he can devour. Satan has been roaming this earth for thousands of years. Satan knows the weakness of man. Satan knows the, the desire and the temptation of the flesh and the desires and the temptation of the eye. He knows all of these things, and he knows how to tempt mankind. And we are no match, just to be honest. None of us is holy. None of us is righteous. None of us here are righteous. We're all sinners in the Lord's house today. We're all saved by the grace of God. And the only hope that we can have in life today is putting our trust in Jesus Christ. Our only hope with standing against a spiritual battle against Satan is being rooted in truth and in Jesus Christ is what we have today. Lastly, as we look at truth, we know that truth comes from the Word of God. And, and I preached upon the Word of God a couple weeks ago, and, and we're only going to cover, when we, Lord willing, unless he, he guides my heart a different way, but we're not going to necessarily cover the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, because I kind of covered that a couple weeks ago, talking about the Word of God. But our foundation is Scripture. It's what we have. It's what God has left us. And I said something a couple of weeks ago that, that if God left us, if God left humanity an instruction book on life, on how to go through the problems and struggles of life, would we read that instruction manual? And all of us would say, yeah, but he did. It's the Bible. It's our instruction manual to life. Now, now, we could say it's difficult to read. It's difficult to understand. It has things in there about genealogy, and it has things in there about kings, and it has things about Old Testament law that doesn't apply to us. Well, you're right, but there's truth in the Bible. All of that leads to who God is and how much he loves mankind. And the simple truths that we read of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, of who Jesus was, and he shared these compassion and these parables and these teachings... We read of the instructions and the letters from Paul that we're reading today shows the love of God, how we're able to go through life and how we're able to, to, to all the things that, that would get us down, that we don't know how to deal with life, that we can be able to turn to God and still have hope. That we find ourselves like Job where he lost his family, he lost his health, he lost his money, he lost all things, but he found hope in the Lord and he never gave up. We read stories of like stories of even David on how that even though David sinned, that he was able to still found forgiveness and hope in Jesus or hope in God. Christ hadn't came, but hope in God at the time. And David was viewed as, as a person after God's own heart. Person after person, struggle after struggle, whether it was Daniel thrown in the lion's den because that he was going against the law of the land and praying three times a day and telling the king, I don't care what you say and the law says, I'm going to hold true to God and his promises. He says, you can throw me and take away my life. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into the fiery furnace that they still had God's promises were still true to them. Even if they were burnt up, they still had the promise of God. 
Even we see the apostles that were people like Stephen that was stoned to death, that he was still able to look to heaven and with a smile and look up to heaven and know that he saw the glory of God. No matter what we go through in life, this earth is temporary, but heaven is eternal. We're, able, we're going to be able to spend eternity with heaven with Jesus Christ where there is no sin, there is no pain, there is no sorrow, there is none of this pain and strife that we go through in life here on this earth because there's no sin in heaven. There's no corruption in heaven. There's no disease in heaven. There's no sadness in heaven because Christ said that I am going to prepare a place for you and if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and receive you under myself. That is truth. That is the truth that we find in the Word of God. That we were able to stand against these spiritual battles. Satan hates the truth. Satan is full of liars. He is a liar. He is a seeker of lies. He is a deceiver in life. Satan continues to try to deceive and to, to spread his lies. All kinds of lies throughout life. And, and sadly, because many begin to believe these lies, some will even fall out um, of following and abiding in Christ because they believe in the lies. Again, how do we know what is true in life? It's through Jesus Christ and His Word. It's our only possible strength. There's no other truth and there's no other foundation. I'll end with this. I told you there's two things about truth. Number one is the first thing that Paul mentioned and number two of how important it was. Without the belt, without truth, everything falls apart. So I said it's the first thing mentioned. I'm going to jump over real quick. Maybe a familiar verse to some of you. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Again, Paul's writing this to the church of Philippi. He says, finally, brother, whatever things are true, first thing he mentions, remember this, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good, report, whatever things are virtue, if there is any of these praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And so here Paul had listed seven things. What's the first thing that Paul mentioned? Whatever is true, think about it. What's the first thing of the six things of the armor of God that Paul mentions? Truth of the belt. Think about that. I, I, I don't believe, I came across this on my own this morning, or yeah, this morning I was looking at scriptures of truth, and, and, I, and I, I don't believe this is a coincidence that as Paul is listing things off, of importance, of living a Christian life and, 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 and relying upon Christ, that he continues and repeatedly starts with truth. I think that's important. It is the foundation. If we can't understand what is true and we can't get our, our, our grounds in life rooted in truth, I believe everything falls apart. When things in life doesn't go our way, Paul says, finally, brother, whatever is true, think upon these things. Think upon the truth. Don't think upon the lies. Don't think upon the sin. Don't think upon the corruption. Don't think about the hurt. Think about the truth. Think about the truth that God loves us today. That God says that he'll never leave you nor forsake you. He'll always be with you even into the ends of the earth is what Christ says. That he sent his spirit to live with us, amongst us, to comfort us, to be with us. These are the truths of life. Stand upon these things. Think upon these things. Dwell upon these things. And when hard times come like they do in all of our lives, we had prayer requests today of, uh, of things, uh, uh, of hurt and physical needs and many unspoken requests from week to week, financial needs and so many other things that we talk about. When all these things come into our way and into our life, think upon what is true. How important it is to read God's word, to apply it to our life. One of the things that we read today in the, in the baby dedication comes out of Deuteronomy chapter 6, where it talks about training up a child in the way that they should go, and talking about from the time that they raise up to the time they go to sleep. It's to continue to reiterate truth. And I think it's important for all of us. I, I know, and I, I think the hard for Christina today, I know uh, their kids go to Emmanuel Christian, our kids go there, and they continue to learn truth and what is true in the Word of God. And how important that is in our life today to be gathered from what is true. If we could all be standing this morning, we're going to draw this to a close.
We're going to pray here in a second, and then we're going to open the altars this morning. If you'd like to pray for whatever the need may be in your life, um, if the Lord has laid something on your heart this morning and you would like to pray, if you're here today and you've never accepted the Lord into your heart, we'd love to be able to lead you into prayer for that. But we're going to pray here in a second. I'm going to lead in prayer, and then we're going to sing a song uh, that's simply, Lord, I need you. Every hour I need you. And through all of life, no matter what we go through, we need the Lord. We need to rely on the truth that is found in Jesus Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Thank you again for this day. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that you have given us a beacon of truth. In a world of darkness, in a world of corruption, in a world of sin, in a world of sadness, in our life, we have something to hold on to. Not just the physical aspect of your word, but your word goes far beyond what is written on these pages. It, it's a lie. We talk about this, Lord. You, you've heard us speak of this on Sunday night. That your Bible, your word, Lord, that you have left us is powerful and it is alive. It, it's a sharper than a two-edged sword that pierces hearts. Lord, your word is what Christ used your son when he was tempted by Satan. It's the truth in our life. And Lord, may we get rooted in your word and your truth. Lord, not our individual truths. Not what we think is right, but Lord, what you say is right. And Lord, may we rely on that. Thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for your, your people and your children that have gathered in your house today. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to sing along with us this morning. Lord, I need you. Um, again, <laughs>
put your hand up. No one looking around, just saying, Pastor, remember me this week. I see those hands. Um, I see other hands being lifted today. And uh, the Lord knows those needs, and uh, we'll be remembering those in our prayer to th- this week. Thank you again for being with us today. We're so glad uh, that you've joined us in the house of the Lord today. Uh, thank you for our visitors, and, and, uh, and baby Kai will be praying for him, um, and that he'll sleep, <laughs> that, that there will be rest in the house. Um, but uh, if there's anything we can ever do uh, for you, uh, let us know. Um, is there any other announcements or anything before we dismiss today? Again, um, service tonight, 5 o'clock, and then Wednesday, 11.30, ladies Bible study here at the church, and then chair volleyball, Lagunda Elementary um, at 6 p.m. Um, if there's nothing else this morning, we'll go ahead and dismiss in prayer. And um, uh, Bob Reville, will you dismiss us in prayer this morning?